So when we talk about generations, there was this grandma, like a lot of us among us, texting her grandson. Can you tell me what IDK, LY, TTL mean? He texts back, I don't know, love you, talk to you later. She responds, it's okay, I'll ask your sister, love you. <laughs> now, if you don't get that, it's a generation thing, okay? <laughs> right there, it's a generation thing if you don't get that. But that's the idea we talk about when we think about generations. Now, when we think about generations, just to begin with, each generation is different. We're different in a lot of ways. When I grew up as a child, my dad was in the Glenn Miller and Big Band. Every night, it was a music appreciation with Glenn Miller and the Big Band. When Jordan was a child, growing up, it was the 60s and the Beatles for what he heard, because that was us. Now, when I come to visit him, it's Frozen. That's all we hear is Disney songs, you know? <laughs> but each generation has a difference. Differences in, in our looks. Differences in the way we dress. Differences in the way we talk. I was talking to one of our teenagers just recently. And I talked about how some of the things we were doing at Charlestown Road went to Uganda and Africa. He said, that's bad. I said, it is? He said, no, bad's good. I said, bad's good, so good's bad. No, good's good. I said, bad's good, good's good, what's bad? Bad? I had to go lay down. I didn't understand what he was talking about. <laughs> you know, we have differences sometimes in that. We also understand each generation faces unique opportunities and difficult trials. Brother Jesse here went through depression, major world war. Each generation has different things. Each generation oftentimes thinks what they go through is worse than any other generation. But there's trials, there's opportunities put before all of us. And then each generation faces the challenge of working together with the next generation. And that's, that's sometimes very hard in congregations. Sometimes this is a hiccup in some congregations. There's a generation clash and they don't get along. And what we're hoping this weekend to kind of show and manifest these things is to look at how it can work wonderfully as God has these things before us. Got your Bibles in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8 is where we're going to be. Romans 8 presents to us two great statements. We remember in verse 28 where it says there in Romans chapter 8 that I can do all things. Let me get that right once again. I'm not as good as Brother Jesse. Romans 8 and verse 28 says, We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called to his purpose. Another great statement is found in verse 29. For whom before known, he predestined to become conformed to his image of his son. But this evening we want to focus on verse 37. Romans 8 verse 37. There the apostle says, But in, but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Other translations will say we are more than conquerors. Philip's translation says we win an overwhelming victory. The uh, common English says we win a sweeping victory. It's not that we just won the ball game. It's not that we just conquered. We are more than conquerors. If this was a baseball game, this is a shutout. This is a no-hitter. If this is the football game we're talking about, it is a total defeat of the other team. We would use like ter terms like a thrashing or a thumping or a romping or a sh just a shellacking of such things. This is the idea of what Paul is trying to manifest in these verses. Like the story of a man one day who stopped by a Little League baseball game. He hadn't seen Little League baseball game in a long time. He's leaning over the, third over the fence there, hollered at the third baseman, says, son, what's the score? He said, 24 the nothing. He said, which one are you? We the nothing. He said, that's pretty bad. He says, no, sir, we haven't come to bat yet. And when we think about this, Paul's not talking about baseball. He's not talking about sports. He's talking about life. He's talking about our journey with Jesus Christ. Notice, if you will, as we continue in this context of Romans chapter 8, some things he says here. He says in verse 18, the sufferings of this present age. He's reminding them that you are in a conflict. This journey is not Disney. This journey is not a walk in the park. We are engaged in a battle before us. 
He would say in verse 31, who is against us? In fact, there's a series of four questions he asks here. Who is against us? Who brings a charge? Who condemns? Who separates? And if you notice this, there's kind of a progression there. First of all, who's against me? Who's my opponent? From that, he wants to bring a charge. From that, because a charge can go this way or that way. This man has decided you are guilty because now I'm condemning you. The next step is I want to separate you. The idea here is this is a conflict Paul is describing. He would go on in the same context in verse 36. We are being put to death all day long. And then he would say in verse also 36, we are sheep being slaughtered. And when we look at these words, we think this is a tough day. But what was Paul's words? We are more than conquerors. We're not getting by by the skin of our teeth. It wasn't a last second shot that won the game. We smoked them, he says. We overwhelmingly conquered them. We are the ones who are the victors in Jesus Christ, as we did say that. We remind ourselves in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, where there the Revelation writer tells us about this conflict that we are engaged in. He says, so the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandment of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Again, that idea that we're engaged in a battle together. Paul would tell Timothy multiple times to fight the good fight of faith. This is one only through Jesus. And that's what we need to see and appreciate. We are more than conquerors. And so we get this idea from the book of Proverbs. The victory, he says, belongs to the Lord. In Jesus Christ, you can be victorious. And we see this over and over in our Bibles. When David fought Goliath, his head rode. When we think about Joshua going up to Jericho, the walls came tumbling down. When we think about Pharaoh chasing the, the Israelites through the Red Sea, the walls came in of the Red Sea and drowned them all. We think about Jesus in the grave and up from the grave he arose. God always gives a mighty, mighty victory. Three of the greatest things we have to face. Number one is the devil himself. You ever thought about how the devil operates we're coming up to Christmas. A lot of you in school will be out of school. Many of you who work will be off of work. Satan doesn't take a day off, doesn't he? He looks at that counter and says, oh, it's Christmas time. I'm going to just take the day off. No, he doesn't do that. He doesn't ever retire. He doesn't ever observe anything like that. Before you get to work, Satan's already there. When you leave work, he's already home beating you. He's everywhere, always our enemy. But through Jesus, we overcome him. Now let's put some verses on this, if you will. Turn with me to the Bible, the book of Hebrews, if you will. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. We remember ourselves by way back in the book of Genesis that through the promise of God, the seed of the woman who crushed the head of the serpent, overwhelmingly conquer, we would say, but in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless that him who had the power of death, that is the devil. He renders him powerless. In the book of 1 John, chapter 3, he's destroying the works of Satan. One of the greatest enemies, one of the greatest conflicts, one of the greatest battles you'll ever face, and there'll be a lifelong battle until Jesus calls you home, is against Satan. He will attack you this way. He'll attack you that way. He'll attack you through friends. He just won't give up until you give in. And you might say, well, man, there's no hope. Why even try? Because we are more than conquerors. Because through Jesus, we can win. Got your Bible? Turn with me to the book of Galatians, if you will. Galatians chapter 5. Once you know us, a little series here of expressions the apostle shows us. This is the help we get from God. This is the hope we have in God. Galatians chapter 5. Paul would use three expressions here. First of all, he says in verse 16, But I say, walk by the Spirit. Well, what does the Spirit give to us? It's right there in your hands. It's the Bible. 
Walk by the Bible is what the apostles tell us. Now look down at verse 18. Be led by the Spirit. How's that done? By following the Word of God, by being obedient to the Word of God. And then verse 25, living by the Spirit, doing what God wants us to do. We need to see how important it is that we, although Satan never backs off, he never quits, he never leaves you alone, the idea here is that through Christ, through Jesus, we are more than conquerors. The day's coming when Satan's not going to bother us ever again. The day's coming when we're going to say goodbye to that nasty person. The day's coming when we know where he's going, but we're going to go some other place. And that's the hope we have in Jesus Christ. And so when we look at passages like this, we need to realize that God gives us the help. It's right there in the Bible. We need, as Brother Jesse said last night, to be obedient to God's word, to remember these lessons these good preachers are giving you, and to build our hope upon these things. Do you remember Gilligan's Island? You young people may not remember that, but it was alive and well still on the reruns. And you had Gilligan, and you had the skipper, and you had the movie star, and Marianne, and all those people. I always liked the professor. He could do anything. He could make coconut bombs. He could make little radios. He could do all kinds of things. But one thing he never did, fix the boat. You know? I mean, that's the problem you have. You're on this island. Fix the boat. Get off the island. Sometimes you and I can do all kinds of things, but we forget to do the most important thing, and that's follow the Bible. We can talk about it. We can read books about it, but we need to put our nose into the book and do what God says. Enemy number two that we're going to face, that's death. That's death. Turn with me in your Bible to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The Apostle Paul almost taunts death here. As he talks in this chapter about the resurrected Jesus, and how we know that we will be resurrected because Jesus was resurrected, he says in verse 55, 1 Corinthians 15, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? It's almost like Paul says, is that the best you got? They ain't nothing. What have you got? And then as this chapter ends, he reminds us of the victory we have in Jesus Christ. The hope we have in Jesus Christ. Back in that Hebrew 2 passage where we read a while ago, it there again emphasized that through Jesus, he became like us to take away the fear of death. Got your Bible? Turn with me to the book of John chapter 12. Excuse me, John chapter 14. John chapter 14. You know, when my wife and I first got married, I thought she had money and she thought I had money. And it didn't take very long that we realized either one of us had any money. We were living in Indianapolis, and one of the things we like to do is drive up on the north side of Indianapolis, places like Zinesville and Carmel, where all the athletes lived, where all the rich people lived, and we'd look at mansions, big mansions. Now let me read this verse. I'm going to tell you what I mean by that. In John 14, he says in verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Some translations say, In my Father's house are many mansions. For a long time, I missed this passage. I thought, well, Brother Ricky's going to have his nice little Texas ranch over here. Have a little gate around it, about five acres. Somebody else will have their little mansion over here. I'll have my mansion over here. And when my wife and I would drive around the north side of Indianapolis, we see these big mansions. I said, that's what mine's going to look like in heaven. We drive a little bit farther, and there's a beautiful Victorian home. She goes, mine's going to look like that. And for years and years, I believed that. But you know what's wrong with that? We're separated. We're not separated in heaven. We're together. What this verse really means is, in my Father's house are many rooms. And I believe there's at least three rooms. One room's over there. It's when you're in your mother's womb. You are a person. You are alive. And you've got to go through a door called birth. 
to come into this room, where we call life. And then we got to go through another door. It's called death. But all we do is go from one room to another room, and Jesus and everything we want on the other side. All death is, is just a door. That's all it is. And that's almost how Paul is presenting that in the book of 1 Corinthians by saying there's nothing to be afraid of. Now you and I, and, and we need to emphasize this, even among our disciples, we get the wrong ideas about death. We get paranoid about that. We sing about heaven. We preach about heaven. But when one of us gets close, it's like, oh, this is the worst thing in the world. Oh, hold on. You do not want to do that. Tell somebody yesterday, common prayer for preachers. Lord, give them a long life. And whenever I, whenever I hear that, I say, Lord, don't answer that. Supersize me. Let me get out of this place. All it is is a door. Don't worry about it. It's just a, everything you want on the other side of that door. So don't look at the door. Don't be worried about the door. Don't be concerned. It's just a door. A door brought you into this room. A door is going to take you out of that room. That's all death is. When we understand Jesus Christ, it's nothing to fear. Is that the best thing you've got, Satan? Death? Jesus stomped on death. Up from the grave he arose. And we can conquer that. And that's the thing we see there. And then number three, as we think about greatest enemies... And that's ourself. That's sometimes our biggest problem is ourself. And so as we think about the concept of discipleship, the concept of discipleship in Luke chapter 9, it begins with denying yourself. What do you want, God? It's not like, you know, I'm here, make me happy. No, wrong idea. Deny yourself. Jesus first. Jesus always. Jesus before all things. And so when we get to passages like Ephesians 4, there the apostle says at the end of that chapter, to put away anger and wrath and bitterness and all those things. Be tenderhearted, kind to each other. The idea of forgiving each other just as God and Christ Jesus has forgiven you. What we conquer is ourself. It's no longer I, it's Jesus. And when we get that idea, it helps us so much to walk this way. Now I want to share with us just two great battles, I think it's before us. And they're both spirits or attitudes. And one spirit is to change the way God has designed the church. There's a great movement about that today. It seems to be centered more on young people. But old people get caught up in this too. The culture, the organization, the purpose, the nature, just whatever the church is. And just to illustrate this, let me show you what's common on the market today. Rethinking church. Here's one that says redefinition of the church, redefining the church, redefining the church, reinventing the church, rebooting the church. There it talks about the idea of remaking the church. Do you see what's missing here? How about returning? How about remaining? How about going back to the scriptures? We have a movement today that's just not satisfied with what God has. I want the church to do more. Well, what do you mean by that? Wouldn't it be cool to have guys up and down the aisles selling cotton candy? Wouldn't it be cool to have something going across the sky? And what they want the church to be is not what you read in the Bible. That is something we have to fight. That is something we have to understand and appreciate. In the book of 1 Corinthians, as Paul here was talking about laying foundations, he says, according to the grace of God, which is given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, another's building on it. But each person must be careful how he builds on it, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. That foundation has been laid. You can't change it. We see in the book of Isaiah, I'm laying a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for the foundation, firmly placed, the passage says. Again, emphasizing for us this wonderful idea. The established church you read about in the New Testament was based upon and built upon the all-sufficiency of the scriptures. God said it, it's good enough. The book of 2 Peter chapter 1, all things pertain to life and godliness has been given to us. And that established church understood the completeness of God's plan. They were content with what God said. What God said worked. It was taking broken lives like 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And it was restoring them by washing them and justifying them and giving them hope in Jesus Christ. 
And what that early church understood was you cannot improve upon what God has built. Do you think Adam, in the book of Genesis, as chapter 3, verse 8, gives us the impression that God was walking in the garden? Do you think Adam ever said to God, man, weather here stinks? You ever think he said that? You ever think he said, well, you know, God, food's not very good here. No, it's called paradise, wasn't it? You couldn't make Eden any better. When we think about the concept of the tabernacle, the temple, we think about God's concept of the law, we think God's concept of the gospel, we think about the sacrifice of Jesus, you cannot make them any better. God always gives us the best. And so when it comes to that pattern of the church, what's the church supposed to be? We go back to the Bible. What are we supposed to do? Let's go back to the Bible. Well, why can't we do this stuff? Because we follow that Bible. God knows what's working. But we have to understand, we've got to conquer that spirit that wants to change. Why can't we be like everyone else? That was tried before back in the book of Kings. Remember that? Why can't we have a king like all the other kings, like all the other nations? And they got kings like them. And what happened, it took them away from God. We don't want to be like others. We want to be what God has made, established and proven by the Lord. But now there's another spirit we've got to fight. Jordan talked quite a bit to the young people. I'm going to talk to my generation. 40 and up. Sometimes when you get to be a senior citizen, You think it gives you the right to be a grump. You know? In fact, one day we were talking about something. I was kind of in a bad mood. My wife said, you're getting to be old and grumpy. And I said, I resent that. I'm not old. (laughs) Grumpy? (laughs) And we can do that. And I believe one of the reasons why we do this is because life is changing so fast. From those my generation and up, we're talking about things we've never talked about. I dare say Brother Jesse, back when he first started preaching, never had a sermon about transgender. Those things weren't thought about. We weren't talking about those things back then. Same-sex marriage. And we look at a younger generation, and my generation has a hard time understanding this. I mean, just the other day, I was driving around, I noticed these little signs. Here's a sign, we'll put up your Christmas tree lights. Well, why can't you put up your own lights? That's what I'm thinking. Here's another sign I saw. For a fee, they'll come and scoop the dog poop out of your yard. Well, it's my dog. Why can't I do that? I don't understand those things. And it can make our generation grumpy. Why is it you can't go to the store and get your food? It has to be delivered. That doesn't make any sense to a lot of people our age. But what we need to see is that spirit can become a stick in the church, too. Here's something we've never done before. It is biblical. It is okay. But I'm against it just because I'm against it. Well, that's wrong. And we need to see that as technology is being used, churches like this congregation, like my congregation, become global. Through live stream and through other avenues, we can reach people all over the world today. And we can stay put in a little bitty neighborhood like we are, or we can see the wonderful tools God has before us. These are concerns we got to have. As you grow older, Jordan talked about that spirit as a young person. We need to have that spirit as an older person. And what example we had this weekend with Brother Jess. I've known a lot of older preachers. I didn't want to be around them because I knew they'd say something about me. Well, this isn't right, this isn't right. Why do you wear ties like that? Why do you wear socks like that? And then just pick on this and pick on that and things like that. And, and, And not encouraging, not helpful. And we need to see it sometimes when we think, why are the young people not coming? It could be because the old grumps like us in the church. So there's a spirit we've got to fight. Yes, things change. And when we get back and we think, and you know, I always think we're like the good old days. Well, the good old days for a lot of us going out to the outhouse, that wasn't too good, was it? You know, you worked all day. And mama cooked all morning to get the breakfast done. As soon as breakfast was over, she had to start getting lunch started. It took her all day to do the laundry. And we got all these conveniences, all these things. We've got to be careful with our thinking. And we've got to be careful that we don't stand in the way of young people. Now, what we need to do is make sure that what they're doing is biblical. We've got to make sure they know that God-given pattern. And understand you've got to stay in your lane as God has that to be for us. But... 
we need to remind ourselves, woe be to me if I call somebody to stumble because I just don't like it. And those are some things that we need to consider as we think about these things. Well, so we wrap this up. We need to see, as the passage says, we are more than conquerors. We're not going to get by by the skin of our teeth. We're going to overwhelmingly conquer through Jesus Christ. What God has given us in the New Testament is powerful and strong. and We're able to do things. I love the story of this bank in New York City. And a new company had just rented an office in that bank. Big, big building. So they decided the nice thing to do was send some flowers. Well, at the florist, there was a mix-up. And so at the new business, they got some flowers that says, deepest sympathy to you. And at the same time, at a funeral home, there were some flowers that said, congratulations on your new location. <laughs> but you know what? I like that. Because that's going to be us someday. This world is not our home. We are going somewhere. We're marching to Zion together, young and old, helping each other. You know, my kids, we have, a, we have a saying we use all the time because they, we're at the place where whenever they come see me, I, it's just a standard rule. I'm buying your lunch. I'm always buying your lunch. But then I always put a little caveat behind that. Remember me when I'm old because it may be next week. But the idea is we help each other. And so you young, when you're hearing these things, and we may not understand your life very well. We may not understand all the things you face in school. I hear this and I hear that. Is it possible for me to look like a guy but say, I am a girl? Is that biblically possible? Well, don't just say yes or no. Let's open some pages. Let's see what God says. And, and, and when some of these older folks need a little help, you'll be the first one to come help. Together, generations, hand in hand, marching to Zion. We'll be talking a little bit more about this tomorrow morning. But someday, when we're all through that door, or we're all on that other side, we'll meet people like Brother Jess. And we'll say, Brother Jess, you may not remember, but a long time ago you said something. And the reason why I'm here is because of you. And about the time you say that, someone's going to tap you on the shoulder. And you turn around, and that guy's going to say, well, you know what? It's because of you I'm here. And someone's going to tap that guy on the shoulder because that's how it works. We help each other get to heaven. This evening, if you're not a Christian, you need to become one. Life is hard. There is battles. But Jesus tells us not only will you win, you will be more than conquerors. You will destroy the enemy, not through you, but through Jesus. Your faith, your walk, your hope in Christ makes all the difference. Never been baptized, you need to, because that's what Jesus wants you to do. If you're a young person, line up with Jordan's sermon. Help us. If you're my generation, line up with these thoughts. Let's help each other. Together, let's go to heaven. We can help you. Why don't you come as we stand and sing?